in your ministry, Lord. So we just hand off the study to you and pray this in your name. Amen. I just want to keep talking about the camp out, but I won't. <laughs> uh, Matthew chapter 9. We talked about the first story that took place, verses 1 through 8 last week. And it's a really neat story that many of you know from childhood, if you're growing up in church. And it's a story where Jesus was teaching at possibly Peter's house. And while he was there, it was so packed, you couldn't get in. And that, that's pretty annoying when you can't get into a venue that you want to get into, like a concert or a sporting event. you got to wait in long lines. And there's a lot of people waiting in line trying to get into these places that Jesus would teach. Can you blame anyone? I mean, I would, I would be part of that crowd as well, part of those multitudes trying to get in to hear Jesus teach. Well, the house was so packed that... These four friends wanted to help their friend who was a paralytic who couldn't walk. He was paralyzed for some time, and he just wanted to hear Jesus. He wanted to get into the place and be taught by Jesus, but he couldn't get there in time. And his friends were so persistent that they crawled on top of the roof and just broke open part of the roof and just lowered him down in front of Jesus. And Jesus is pretty amazed by their faith these four guys, these four friends. And we know that there was four because Mark's gospel reveals to us that there was four friends that brought this paralytic man. And Jesus said, your son, son, you know, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. And so many people are led to believe, was this guy even looking for a healing? He just wanted to hear Jesus. He just wanted to see Jesus, know him. And Jesus, seeing his heart, seeing the, the faith of the friend says, you're forgiven. You believe in me. And the Pharisees were just tripped out, the scribes, because they say in the other Gospels, Mark and Luke, that only God alone can forgive sins. So who does Jesus think he is? Well, they knew. He's, Jesus is God. It's something that as we're traveling through the Gospels, uh, Jesus didn't hide being God. He very much so revealed that to humanity. And so Jesus says, well, what's, easy, what's easier for you to say? Uh, your sins are forgiven you or rise up you know, take, a, take up your bed and walk. And that man at that very moment took up his bed and he walked. And that's a miracle. And they were just all blown away. They all marveled. I'm, I'm sure that the Pharisees were upset that Jesus showed them up once again. Uh, but that was the uh, story that we went over last week. And so now we're going to go to verse 9, and it's going to reveal to us Matthew, who's the author of this book. Don't want my little pink things falling out. Um, notes. <laughs> but Matthew's going to record to us his testimony, a brief uh, snippet of how he got called into the ministry. So verse 9 says, Jesus passed on from there, and he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. He was at work. <laughs> it doesn't say that in your Bible, but he was at work. And he said to him, follow me. So he arose and he followed him. And it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So us Christians, these are very famous verses for us, that Christ came and associated with sinners. Christ ate and sat down, hung out with sinners. We, we, we like talking about this. So let's kind of dive into this. According to Mark chapter 2, uh, when Jesus, Jesus was actually going back to the Sea of Galilee to continue to teach, Jesus loved to teach the things of God. That was important to him because he is God and he has come to declare the kingdom of God and that we need to repent of our sins to be a part of the kingdom of God. And he wanted to reveal his heart to all of humanity, the plans and the purposes for all of us. And so he was always constantly teaching. He was teaching in the synagogue. He was teaching at Peter's house when the paralytic, paralytic man was dropped right down in front of him. And right from there, he continued to teach. I mean, I've thought about on Wednesday nights to do a teaching marathon and just see how long I can go until I drop. 
But Jesus, he continued to teach. He would move from one place to another place and teach. And he went, according to Mark chapter 2, he went by the Sea of Galilee to continue to teach. And as he passed on, he passes the tax office of where Matthew's at. And he just looks at him in the eye and says, follow me. And he, follow, and he just drops everything and he, and he goes. Some speculate that Matthew was interested in the things of Jesus. The Chosen series, if you've watched the Chosen series, have, have any of you guys watched the Chosen series? Most of you? No, seriously, everyone, raise your hand if you've seen the Chosen series. Really? About half. The Chosen series. I would actually endorse that as a pastor. So if you have time, watch the first four episodes for free on YouTube. <laughs> Just type in the Chosen series. And then if you want to watch the whole series, you go to their website, and you can finish it from there. Uh, it's honestly probably the best Jesus film that's ever been put out. That's, I know I'm making it sound pretty epic, but it is. So in that series, they also allude that Matthew is observing Jesus up to this point in time. He's a tax collector, so he's dealing with hundreds of people a week. And he's hated. None of us like to pay taxes. Mitch, I hear you talk about, talk, talking about taxes all the time. And we do, as Americans, we get frustrated paying taxes. We're, just, we're going through tax season. Sorry if you haven't done your taxes yet. April 15th is coming up. But Matthew was, uh, like many other tax collectors, that were just hated. Uh, they were notorious for taking advantage of people. They worked with the Romans who were oppressing them in the land of Israel. And so it was a Jewish tax collector's job to go in and tax the fishermen. So you, may, you, you definitely wonder what Peter, James, and John must have thought of Matthew in the past and wonder what their relationship was like. But they weren't necessarily looked upon favorably. They were called sinners for a reason. Uh, they took advantage of people often. They would gather taxes and, and pay the demand that the Roman Empire imposed on the people. And the tax collectors often would gather just a little bit more so that they could benefit as well uh, from the people. And so tax collectors weren't looked favorably on. And, and so maybe Matthew has been looking in. I'm, I definitely know this. I definitely believe that Matthew has heard many stories about Jesus up to this point. Again, he's interacting with hundreds of people during the week. And he's hearing about the healings. He's hearing about, you know, Jesus crossing the sea possibly and, 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 and setting the demon-possessed man free, which we went over that last week in chapter 8. But whatever knowledge he had or he didn't have, all I know is that Jesus came to him and called him and looked him in the eye and said, follow me. And he followed. He counted the cost. He left his job. He left his occupation and decided to follow. Now, a couple weeks ago, there was a couple ambitious guys that we read about that wanted to follow Jesus, but they did not count the cost. One of them didn't even think about what it meant to follow Jesus. He was ready just to dive full into the ministry, and Jesus said, man, you haven't even thought about this yet. I don't even know where I'm staying tonight. Birds have places they stay. Foxes have holes, but I don't know where I'm staying tonight. And that guy ended up, we don't know if he ended up following Jesus or not. And then another guy, he counted the cost and said, I don't really want to follow you yet. I want to go home and deal with my dad who might be passing away soon. So I'm going to take some time. He counted the cost and felt it wasn't that time yet for him to follow. I guarantee you that Matthew counted the cost. He was a tax collector. I definitely think he was good with numbers. And I think that he was evaluating his life. And he felt the pulling of the Holy Spirit when Jesus said those words, they should be in red in your Bible. It's follow me. And he says he just arose and he followed him. Man, such faith. But it caused me to think about my life. I had the same similar experience, and you do too. As a born-again Christian, you know that the Lord came to you that day, that morning, or that evening, and he called you to follow him. And 1999 is when the Lord called me to follow him. And, and when I say follow him, first and foremost, into salvation. Like the Lord was pulling at my heart to receive him as my savior, to, to repent of my sins and just give my life to him. I remember that day. It was in 1999, fall of 1999. My life was like in shambles and the Holy Spirit was calling me. He was wooing me into a relationship and I was counting the cost. And I decided, you know what? My life as an 18 year old kid up to this point wasn't very good. The decisions I was making in my life was leading me down a not a good path. 
And so as a young man, I was willing to be counting the cost. You know what? My direction that I'm on is not very good, and, and projecting my outcome seems like I'm a failure right now. I'm just going to give my life to the Lord and see what he does with it. And then there's a second time I believe that the Lord called me, and that was to serve him in the ministry. And I want to share this story real quick, and I, and I, I would rather pay more attention about Matthew for sure. But we really do need to count the cost when the Lord says, follow me. And I'll never forget when I was working at this magnet place in Spokane, Washington, the owner, he went to our church. He gave me a job there. I was actually working there to save up money for Bible college. I had prayed and, and Lord, if you want me to go to Bible college, please get me accepted. And I got accepted. I took that from the Lord that he wanted me to go, that he was calling me to go serve him, to be a disciple. I, la I learned later on they accept everybody. It's like, <laughs> like, <laughs> But still, like, I guess if you get accepted, God wants you to go there. Um, but my, uh, my boss sat me down before I went. He took me out to eat, the owner of the company. And I was like 18, 19. And he was like, Chris, I want to send you to Pittsburgh, and I want you to work the CNC machines and get all certified. And when you come back, you know, I'm, I'm going to pay you $60,000. He's like, and he's like, you're 18. He's like, not too many 18-year-old kids can just walk out of high school and making $60,000. And he's like, I got big plans for you. And, and I had to just, you know, as a young kid, I had to tell him. I said, Tom, I'm, God's called me to Bible college. And he's like, well, you can go to Bible college here in Spokane at Moody Bible Institute. Go to Bible college here. He's like, go to Pittsburgh and then come back and go to Bible college and work the job. And I'm like, no, like, I don't know why. I don't even know. I, I just can't tell you why, but I know the Lord is calling me to California to go to Bible college, and I got to trust him. I counted the cost. You could kind of see your future, what direction you may go, but I just knew in my life that the Lord wanted me to go to California to Bible college. So think about that when the Lord called you. He called Matthew. He called Peter, James, and John. He called you. Is he calling you now? Is there someone here sitting here today this morning that you know that the Lord's been calling you? Have you answered it? Have you counted the cost? Are you following him? His words to you, same thing with Matthew. They were to me, follow me. Count the cost. Have you decided to follow Jesus and he's calling you into the ministry? Is he asking you to serve somewhere at your local church or in your home as a husband or as a wife, I mean, the Lord's always convicted me about my wife and my kids. But listen to that voice. I really do believe those words, follow me, are very consistent with who God is. He rose up and he followed. In verse 10 again, it doesn't give us the information that Mark and Luke do, but Matthew actually did invite Jesus into his home to eat. And he got all of his sinners together, all the tax collectors and so no wonder that you had the Pharisees, the religious leaders of their day, they were always judgmental. They're pointing the finger. Like, why is Jesus hanging out with the sinners? Does that make him a sinner too? What's wrong with him? Why are you doing this? Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Well, Jesus tells them why. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. And see, the Pharisees missed that. Jesus came to save humanity from hell from damnation, from our sins. Sin has separated us from God. Mankind has a sickness that's so much greater than COVID-19. You would think that like this world who's so worked up about the virus, I mean, if, we're, if you really, really are concerned about your body, and to a degree, we should be. You should be concerned about your physical being. You should. We should take care of ourselves. That's natural. God has put that within us. But how much more our spiritual state? Because we all have a soul, and our souls are marked with a virus called sin, and we need him. And that's why he came, to give us the cure. Mankind sometimes come up, comes up with cures for things, but Jesus has a cure, it's himself. And so that's why he came to present himself as an offering on the cross and rise again on the third day. The Pharisees missed it. They felt like they didn't, they thought that they were pretty good, that they didn't need a physician, that they had the the law of God, and that was good enough. But Jesus tells them straight up, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Before we read Hosea chapter 6, so if you kind of want to thumb to Hosea chapter 6, I'm going to kind of filibuster for a minute. Um, 
I do believe that we should associate with sinners as Christians. How else will they not hear about the gospel? We should. It's interesting that these sinners were pretty darn hospitable and generous to Jesus and Matthew. I actually wrote in my Bible, are unbelievers more generous and hospitable than I am? Makes me think sometimes. We are to emulate what these sinners did for Jesus and Matthew. We are to be hospitable. We are to be generous, loving and caring and sitting down with other people that might not think like us, that might not look like us, people that we might perceive that are worse off than us. We are to sit down and have uh, fellowship, koinia in the Greek, and present Jesus, if anything, through love. Jesus said that many people will know that you're my disciples for your love for one another. So I do believe as, as a church, as Christians, we should be going out to the world with sinners and emulating Jesus and connecting with them and presenting Jesus to them. There's another teaching in the book of Corinthians that Paul says that. He actually says, I didn't say you shouldn't go out and hang out with the world. Like you probably should so they can hear about Jesus. But there's a balance to that where he says, all I said is that you shouldn't be hanging out with people who call themselves Christians that are living a corrupt lifestyle. So that's a different study for a different day. But we are to go into the world and bring Christ to people. So Hosea chapter 6. Jesus tells them, go and learn what this means. That's pretty important to know what he's saying there. You guys are Pharisees and scribes who know the word of God. Go and find out what this means. I desire mercy and sacrifice. So if they did their homework that Jesus said, they would turn to Hosea chapter 6, and I'm going to read up to verse 6. So can you just imagine? It definitely makes me wonder if any of them did what Jesus said. Go and learn what this means. So Hosea chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Come and let us return to the Lord. For he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up, that we may live in his sight. Let us know. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come and take us Come to us like the rain, like the latter and the former rain to the earth. O Ephraim, what shall I do? O Judah, what shall I do to you? For your faithfulness is like a morning cloud. That's not good, by the way. <laughs> morning clouds that just dissipate real quick. Your faithfulness isn't very much. And like the early dew, it just goes away. Therefore, I have hewn them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. And your judgments are, are like light that goes forth. For I desire mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. So many years before Jesus associated with the sinners and, and the Pharisees calling them out, many years before this, the Jewish people like many of us sometimes, got really, you know, really rooted in tradition and ritual and lost the meaning of why they were doing some of the feasts and some of the sacrifices. They were just going through the motions thinking that, you know, if they practiced X, Y, and Z, that they would be holy before God and their hearts weren't in it. They weren't really pursuing God anymore. They were just going through the motion. And Jesus says, do you remember that? Go and search that out. Basically, Jesus is saying, you're like your forefathers who were just going through the motions of offering up burnt sacrifices, trying to adhere to the law of God. But Jesus says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. So they miss the heart of God, the Pharisees. And, you know, they have an opportunity to receive Christ just as much as the, the sinners do, the, ta the tax collectors. The Pharisees are sinners, but, but they don't think so. They think that they're okay. They think, they think that they're, they're willing to wage their tradition and rituals. They're willing to wage all that on the day of judgment when they stand before God, that they, that they complied. I don't want to stand before God someday thinking I complied. I just want to stand before God and be like, I received your son. He's the only way. I don't deserve to be in here. <laughs> it's only because of your son, Jesus Christ. I'm a sinner. Jesus lovingly rebuking them. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This is the gospel. We need to repent, to turn away from our sinfulness. And when we don't know Christ, we are sinners. Like, I mean, we're still sinners. For while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
The Pharisees thought they were righteous. Jesus said this in the Mount of Beatitudes that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and the scribes, you won't be able to go to heaven. (laughs) But the Pharisees didn't have righteousness. So verse 14, Matthew was called, and many people heard Jesus speak that night. makes you wonder the kind of conversations. We'll find that stuff out in heaven, the more of the backstory. In verse 14, it says, Then the disciples of John came to him. This is John the Baptist. Then the disciples of John the Baptist came to Jesus, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one, pizza, no one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment, and the tear is made worse. Verse 17, nor do they put new wine into old wineskins or else the wineskins break, the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put the new wine in the new wineskins and both are preserved. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, verse 14. Now, it's hard to read into text, like emotions into text sometimes. Even when we all text each other sometimes, your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, your friends, Sometimes you read a text and you can't read the emotion. You're trying to like, are they mad right now? Like, are they judging me right now? Like, I can't really figure it out. So some people use emojis, little smiley face behind uh, their text so you know that, okay, they're good. I'll do that too. Um, So are the disciples of John the Baptist coming with a judgmental attitude? I don't know. I I would, I'm reading this as no. I think that they're genuinely, uh, you know, just, questioning how come your disciples don't fast like fasting's a good thing fasting is taking some time out of your busy schedules and really focusing on god denying yourselves of bodily food and just maybe there's something going on in your life some kind of event marriage a, a death of someone someone's sick you know something something tragic in your nation has taken place and there are times that we do you know, set aside to fast. And the disciples of John the Baptist, who are definitely concerned about the Messiah, Jesus, they know who he is. And well, how come they don't fast? Even the Pharisees fast, which aren't good. Like when they fast, it's not good. Jesus already told us in Matthew chapter six, that when you do fast, don't fast like the hypocrites, like the Pharisees do, because they're just doing it to be seen by people, which makes you wonder about Lent. Lent is going on for the Catholics. And they, you know, they, you know, I don't know if a lot of people realize when they participate in Lent, and if you put the ashes on your forehead and you're walking around and you're proclaiming your fast, Jesus said you shouldn't do that. Like, it's a good thing to fast, but you should do it privately. He actually said, go wash your face, make yourself look healthy, because that fast is between you and God. That's all that matters. People don't need to know about you fasting. Like, we don't need to know that. Because, you know, unfortunately, as human beings, we're, we're prideful and we like to... We like for people to view us highly and, 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 and better than we really are. And Jesus says, don't be like the hypocrites when you fast. And the Pharisees were that way. I mean, we're going to read a story in about a couple months, if I ever get there, where there's a Pharisee that he's praying in the temple, and he looks over at a tax collector who's in the temple praying, and the tax collector can't even like look up to heaven because he's so guilty before God. He's just like beating his chest, Lord, I'm a sinner, forgive me. And Jesus said the Pharisees over there are like, Lord, thank you, I'm not like that guy. I fast twice a week. So he's like trusting on his works. It's good to fast, but if you're fasting because you think it's a good work that's going to get you into heaven, you're fasting for the wrong reason. That's not going to get you into heaven. Jesus. How come your disciples don't fast? It's a great question. Fasting isn't bad. Why aren't you doing it? And Jesus simply tells them in verse 15, think of a wedding, which I'm doing a wedding today at 3 o'clock, so this is pretty cool, for Keith and Anna Anderson. Jesus said to them, can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with him? It's a rhetorical question. I mean, the answer is no. You know, they're not going to as long as Keith is hanging out with his groomsmen and his best man, you know, they're all buddies, you know, everything is going good, but as soon as he goes on his honeymoon and leaves, you know, they might be kind of bummed out that their buddy, the bridegroom, is gone. But while the bridegroom is there, they don't mourn, but the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, then they will fast. Jesus is prophetically speaking of himself. Jesus right here 
with the disciples, the Pharisees, whoever's listening to him in this moment, Jesus is saying that he is the bridegroom. And he's saying right here that there is no need for my disciples to fast to God because God is among them. Wow, dude, I'm telling you, dude, this stuff gives me chills, dude. Jesus does not hide from being God. We fast to fast to God. And Jesus just said to the Pharisees, to John the Baptist's disciples and, John, you know, this guy too, that I'm God and I'm here in the midst of my people. And as long as I'm here in their midst, they don't need to fast because God is here. They can come to me now. They can draw close to me now. In this section, Jesus is saying, I'm God. If he's not, he's committing blasphemy. And he's not committing blasphemy because he is God. He prophetically speaks of his death. He says, when, they will, when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, then they will fast. This is Jesus saying that he would be taken. He'll be taken away. He will be nailed to the cross. He will rise from the grave. Then they will fast. There will come a time where Peter, James, and John, Matthew, they will all fast. But they don't need to while Jesus is there in the midst because he's God. It's amazing. No one puts a peace. Verse 16 and 17 there's, you know, a lot of teachers, a lot of pastors uh, will spend a lot of time in verses 16 and 17 to go over how Jesus is saying that the old covenant is on the way out and the new covenant is on the way in through him. And that is true, but I don't think that's what he's saying because I believe that he's just using this parable in verses 16 and 17. In the Gospel of Luke, he, he says, let me tell you a parable. And then he reads, then, then verse six, 16 and 17 proceeds. I believe he's using this short little analogy to hammer home the point that fasting is good, but it makes no sense when Jesus is in your midst, when I'm in your midst, when God is with you here and now. It just doesn't make sense. Like an old piece of unshrunk cloth, or a new piece, you would not put a new piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. It just makes no sense. I'm here. I'm, I'm here and now. I watched a show called, uh, on YouTube, it's called uh, I Bought a Ghost Town <laughs> in uh, California. And it's pretty cool. It, he bought this mine for like $1.4 million in Saragoto Mines in California. It used to be the number one uh, silver mine that helped build like L.A., and this guy, he's like my age. He looks like Bones over there. They look like brothers. Uh, but he bought the mine. And the reason I'm bringing this up is that he's looking for the elusive blue jeans. And I didn't know what that meant when I first started watching it. But if you find uh, blue jeans in a mine, a couple hundred years old, Levi jeans, they're worth up to like $50,000 up, even, even more than that. So he's like not looking for silver. He's looking for Levi blue jeans. Well... He's found, he's found some pieces of blue jeans, but he found this really cool, like, 200-year-old jacket, mining jacket. But, dude, that thing is, like, tore up. It's, like, it's old. It's an old piece of garment. And it would be foolish to, you know, if he was trying to actually repair that and put, like, a brand-new patch, new cloth on that, because it literally would, once you put the jacket on, it would just tear. It wouldn't even matter if it was a brand-new patch. The, 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 the clothes are pretty worn out. It just doesn't make sense to do that to preserve it that way. And Jesus even says wine, putting new wine in an old wineskin just doesn't make sense. You do that, you're just going to ruin it, and it's just going to cause the old to burst. Now, I understand the new covenant and the old covenant, but it seems mysterious to me, um, almost like Jesus is mysteriously teaching that. He's not coming out and saying the words old covenant, new covenant. I'm, you know, Obviously, many teachers uh, go that way. I just think that Jesus is really hammering the point that while I'm here because I'm God, I'm the Son of God, it just makes no sense. And that when I'm gone, you know, when he says that when you, when you, when you allow the old wine to be in the old wineskin and the new wine in the new wineskin, both are preserved. He's not saying that fasting is bad. He's not condemning the old way of fasting at all. He just says it doesn't make sense. And he says when I'm gone, they're going to fast again. And so hopefully that sufficed enough for John's disciples. It's enough for me. It makes sense to me that when Jesus Christ is in the flesh, there's no need to fast because he's right there with you. Do I believe that we should fast now? Absolutely. I actually think that's a practice that I don't do often enough. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 that when you do fast, this is what you should do. So go read Matthew chapter 6 if you don't know how to fast. But I do think it's important. So verse 18, 
Let's see where we can stop here. While he spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler came and worshipped him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. So Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. I wrote my Bible that ministry is zero to 60. So quick. I mean, Jesus is being questioned about fasting, being put on the spot. And it says while he's, you know, speaking these things, like mid-sentence almost, I don't know. It just says that while he was speaking these things, explaining fasting, that someone named Jairus, according to Matthew, or Mark chapter 5, that's how we know this guy's name, Jairus, the ruler of a synagogue, comes and interrupts and says, you know, first of all, worships, this falls down and starts begging him and imploring him that he would come and heal his daughter. Some, some of the other gospels say that she's uh, at the point of death. Matthew just says that, you know, she's dead, that she was near death, that the doctors, probably the physicians that were checking out his young daughter, which we know according to Mark chapter 5, she was 12 years old. She was 12 years old. My, I have a daughter that's 13 right now, so, and her name's Talitha, and this, girl's, this girl, actually Jesus, lifts her hand up and says, Talitha Kumi, rise. That's why we named our daughter Talitha, uh, because this is the story where Jesus later on lifts her up and she comes back to life. But this ruler just comes and throws himself at Jesus' feet, begging, imploring, zero to 60 in the ministry. Me and Charlie have been talking about this a lot recently, how you can, you can just go about intermingling with people, talking about things, normal things. Uh, you could be talking about a wedding, and then someone texts you and says, my grandpa just died last night. One of my friends texted me that just a couple days ago. And I don't remember what I was doing at that time at my house, but zero to 60 real quick, because the Bible says that we should rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And Jesus, more than any of us, I mean, I, I don't even lightly touch the surface of the ministry that Jesus was in, but he went from explaining fasting to someone saying, my daughter is dead. My daughter is dying. Can you please, please implore and worshiping him? Please. He's a ruler of a synagogue, meaning he knows spiritual things. I mean, he's a teacher of God's word. He's an overseer. You could almost kind of compare him like a pastor. Jairus comes and throws himself at Jesus' mercy, just showing that faith. Please just come and touch her. I know that she will live. I mean, he's expressing that Jesus can raise her from the dead. You know who he thinks Jesus is. He's worshiping him for one. As a Jewish ruler of a synagogue, he knows that you're only to worship the Lord God, the Lord him alone, Jehovah. And he's worshiping, saying, you can raise my daughter from the dead. That's faith. That's great faith. I mean, you and I, we have faith that God can raise the dead, but we have the Bible to really kind of point, point to and go through and see that Jesus raised people from the dead. I mean, one of the only stories that him as a, as a Jewish, you know, ruler, he would, he would call upon Elijah and Elisha, like in, in the book of Kings in the Old Testament, where a prophet raised a child back from the dead. But this man shows great faith, and he throws himself at Jesus. And I, we're going to have time this morning. But he's, ask, he's actually asking Jesus to do something potentially that makes you unclean in the law of God. In the book of Leviticus, you can't touch a dead body. If you touch a dead body in Leviticus, you become unclean and you are to be excommunicated from the camp for a certain amount of days until you go through the ritual processes of being clean again. So he's expressing faith as well that Jesus won't become unclean, that he is the clean that can make the unclean rise again. So he th comes by faith, really trying to judge when I should stop here. Verse 20, suddenly, zero to 60 in ministry, I'm explaining fasting. Someone comes and tells me their daughter is dying. And then suddenly a woman, as he's going to meet this little girl, suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. God bless you. For she had said to herself, if I only may touch his garment, I shall be made well. But Jesus turned around and when he saw her, he said, be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. More faith from these people in Israel. A flow of blood, a hemorrhaging. It's an embarrassing, it's, it's, it would be embarrassing and just something that she struggled with all these years. Because again, in the Levitical law, in, Le, in, the, in the book of Leviticus, verse 15, if she like, with this flow of blood issue, if she sat in a seat and then someone else sat in that seat, they would become unclean 
If she came in contact with anyone during this flow of blood issue, it would cause people to be ceremonially unclean. Let me read it to you real quick. Leviticus 15, verse 25. If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days other than that, than at the time of the customary impurity, or if it runs beyond her usual time of impurity, all the days of her unclean discharge shall be as the days of her customary impurity. She shall be unclean. For every bed on which she lies all the days of her discharge shall be to her as the bed of impurity. And whatever she sits on shall be unclean in the uncleanliness of her impurity. Whoever touches those sayings shall be unclean. He shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. And just goes on. He continues to talk about the instructions of what to do. And so you got to really love her heart. I mean, there's a lot of people, the, the other gospels say that Jesus is surrounded. People are thronging at him, trying to get a hold of him. The disciples are kind of batting people away, the security guards apparently. And Jesus, according to the other gospels, he knows that someone touched him. He could feel, according to the other gospels in Mark chapter 5, it says that he felt power go out from him and heal someone. And he says that. In the other gospels, he says, who touched me? And the disciples are actually like, are you kidding me? There's so many people around. And you're asking who's touching you? And you know what's interesting? Everyone got afraid and no one, no one wanted to come forward. No one wanted to say anything. And it tells us in Mark chapter 5 that this woman, being fearful and trembling, she says, it was me. It was me. <laughs> I touched you. And he tells her, be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. Again, Jesus technically should be ceremonially unclean because she had a flow of blood problem. And according to, again, Leviticus 15, this would make him unclean, but he is God. I, again, Jesus isn't hiding his deity. He's the one true God that visited us. He visited us 2,000 years ago. God visited us. People make movies like the Marvel movies, and they, and they make a huge deal out of superheroes and stuff. But it really happened. There's one God in the universe, and he came and visited us, and he saved us. Many people don't realize that. We look up to Captain America and Iron Man and, well, maybe you don't. Maybe you're, maybe you're a DC and you look up to Batman and Superman. I don't know. Have you seen the shirt where all the superheroes are sitting around Jesus and, they, and, and, and Jesus has the question mark that's coming out of his mouth while he's looking at Batman and Spider-Man and all of them? And he says, let me tell you how I saved the world. I, I just think it's a cool shirt. Um, Jesus doesn't hide who he is. God visited us. The Son of Man, the Son of God, power went out and ch touched her and, and cleansed her, and he's not unclean. He is the clean. While he's on, his, on the road to heal this, this other daughter, isn't this weird, a different, an interesting connection? The daughter that he's about to go touch and raise up to life is 12 years old, and this woman, she had a flow of blood issue for 12 years. Just very interesting. Your faith, for by, gr for by grace you are saved through faith. It's not, it's not of yourselves. Not of yourselves, not of any of the works that we do, but according to God's grace through Jesus, we're saved. It's by faith. Verse 23, Jesus came into the ruler's house. We'll close with this. We'll just close with this story. Jesus came into the ruler's house, this is Jairus, and saw the flute players playing and the noisy crowd wailing. And he said to them, make room for the girl. Make room for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. They made fun of him. Are you kidding me? She's passed. She passed hours ago. In the Mishnah, a Jewish writing, it was a thing where Jewish people would actually hire professional wailers and musicians to come in and wail uh, on the behalf of your, of your child that has, or person who's passed away. And they, they begin to ridicule and mock Jesus. But when the crowd was put outside, he went in, and by the way, Mark and Luke record that Peter, James, and John and the mother and the father were allowed to come in. So this account that we're reading, Matthew didn't get to really personally experience this. This was told to him by Peter, James, and John, and Jesus himself. So Jesus takes in Peter, James, and John, the mother and father, according to Mark chapter 5. He goes into the room, takes her by the hand. says he went in and took, took her by the hand, and the girl arose. In Mark's gospel, he utters the words, Talitha kumi, rise. And the report of this went out into all the land. He resurrects a dead body and brings her back to life. Amazing story. I mean, again, Jesus, only God can do that. 
There's no one else. No one else has ever on record been able to do that. Only he can do that. While she was sleeping, what's that mean? Is she dead or is she sleeping? Sleeping, better translated, she was resting. The girl's not dead, she's resting. Jesus knows what he's about to do. She had passed, but he was about to do this mirac miraculous work that they had never seen before. And, and just what a story. That's why I named my daughter Talitha. Tirza, Trinity, Talitha. Right here. Little girl, arise. Numbers chapter 19, verse 11. If you touch a dead body, it makes you unclean. Not Jesus. He touched a dead body, raised it back to life. The clean makes the unclean clean. Amazing. Only God can do that. I do believe that children who die before the age of accountability, which I think is different for a lot of kids, do go to heaven when they die. I just wanted to throw that out there, since we're talking about children who pass away. Um, my wife and I, we've had a, my wife's had a miscarriage and I, and I, in the past, and I full-on anticipate meeting my son or my daughter in heaven someday. And we know that David in the Old Testament, when his child died, that he uttered the words that he can't come to me, but I can go to him someday. And so I believe that this little girl, Talitha, if she would have remained dead, would have been in heaven. Their kids, their, their parents would have been able to see. I mean, I know this is controversial for some, but I, this is just my personal opinion and belief through studying the Word of God that children who pass away under the age of accountability, which again could be different for others, I do believe uh, are in the presence of the Lord. And you think about all those aborted babies around the world for how many years, I do believe heaven is just full of kids. <laughs> now, people, we, 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 it's campfire talk. Like, you know, we talk about things like, like this around the campfire, but what age are we in heaven? You know, almost everyone wants to be like, well, maybe like Adam and Eve were just like created, like Adam and Eve were kind of created just mature. So I, I don't know, are we like in our 20s to... I shouldn't say what else because I want to make you feel old, but uh, I mean, but I don't know what age we're going to look like. I mean, are there, I don't know, but it just fascinates me in heaven to see. But I do know that there's like millions and millions of people that are, uh, I believe personally in heaven, these little kids that were aborted, they're, they're uh, I'm at least comforted in that, that they're with the Lord, you know. Jesus loves little children. He does. He says, don't. The disciples were, were, were uh, willing and wanting to shoo the kids away. And Jesus said, don't do it. Let them come to me. Let them come to me. Jesus has a heart for kids. That, that really got to him when that 12-year-old girl was, was dead. That, that minute, that he had compassion on her. Let's pray. If you need prayer, uh, it's open and available to, you know, I can pray with you. Uh, Pastor Charlie, the other elders, uh, are willing to pray with you. If you, if you have any kind of needs, uh, just come talk to us, and uh, we would be blessed to do that. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for this morning, God, and just seeing how great and awesome you are, that there is no one like you, that you indeed are the only one, that you visited us 2,000 years ago, and you proclaimed the kingdom of God to us, Lord. I pray, Lord, if there's anyone in this room right now that is feeling you calling them, Lord, to follow, the, follow you, that they would respond to that. Lord, I, I pray that they would respond to that in their heart right now, Lord. They would cry out to you from within themselves, Lord, I want to follow you. Forgive me my sin, Lord. Wherever you take me, I'll go. It doesn't matter. No strings attached. Whatever you want to do in my life, I'll follow you. Thank you that you've done that to so many people in this room. And myself too, God, I don't deserve it again, but I just love you, God. We love you. We're just enamored with you, everything that you've done for us. And we just thank you for the miraculous events that we get to read about because we know that you still work today, that you do the miraculous even now. We pray for those that are sick, that are our friends, our family members, our, our husbands, our wives, our grandma and grandpas, our friends, Lord, our coworkers that are asking for prayer. Lord, they got cancer and diseases and sicknesses, Lord. We just usher them in, in, into your presence. And we know that you're flexible and we know that you're loving because we see it in your word, Lord, that you're constantly being interrupted and you're still ministering to people. Lord, by your grace, we would ask now, Lord, for on the behalf of others that are sick, Lord, if you could touch them and heal them. 
where they're at, Lord. First and foremost for salvation, but secondly, Lord, we just ask by mercy if you could touch their physical sickness and heal them. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. God bless you guys.